to see everyone. Uh, thank you, Nicholas, and good morning to all. Thank you for braving the New York City traffic to, uh, to get here. Uh, we, have a, we have a good agenda and, 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 and really look forward to, uh, to presenting it to, uh, to you. Um, 14th annual conference for shipping for, for Capital Inc. Um, and we're, we're absolutely pleased to be back at a physical event again after a too long hiatus. I'm just going to make a few brief comments because I think we want to get to the panels, but I um, wanted to say a few words. Um, on the back of a global economy that was emerging quite robustly during 2021, 2022 has really proven to be a much more challenging and in many respects tragic year. Uh, we've seen a ramping up of inflation to the two levels that we haven't seen in 40 years. Uh, behind the curve, central bankers are playing an aggressive game of catch up with significant interest rate increases, growing threat of, an, of recession, increasing signs of global climate distress, uh, and we can't uh, not mention the devastating Russian invasion of Ukraine and the severe impact uh, and fallout of the Western sanctions that were imposed in response. That's just to name a few of the factors. Uh, and as, as we might expect, uh, the markets haven't reacted very, very well to these developments. Uh, we've seen significant sell-offs in equity and fixed income markets, significantly increased volatility in equity valuations and interest rates, and a precipitous drop in capital markets issuance levels. And I think with the apparent hardening line uh, of the world's central bankers on, on fighting inflation, and let's see what the Fed comes with today, uh, upward pressure on interest rates is clear, accompanying growing threat of recession in Europe and the US. I think it's reasonable to expect that the market volatility and subdued capital market environment is going to be with us for some time. I would say in many ways the world has been turned on its head in the last seven months and is seen, as is seemingly so often the case, shipping has landed on its feet in a turbulent global macroeconomic environment. Dry bulk and container shipping were the immediate beneficiaries of the global economy emerging from the pandemic, driven by renewed demand and significant disruptions in logistics chains. Increased commodity prices and the intense focus on energy security in Europe has hugely benefited the crew, the product, and the LNG tanker markets. Energy security has become a parallel priority for everyone, together with the energy green transition. I think uh, this situation will also continue for the foreseeable future. But again, shipping, I feel, has in many respects landed on its feet. With the exception of LNG and container shipping, uh, the order books in pretty much all other sectors remain at historically low levels. Uh, that's a great starting point when thinking about uh, the sustainability of the current cycle. The reluctance to order uh, new builds continues to be primarily driven by regulatory uncertainty. But in addition, we now have uh, significantly increased new building prices driven by the inflation that we all see and strained uh, supply chains. De delivery times have also increased dramatically, you know, upwards of, of three plus years now uh, as a best case. With the positive market backdrop for shipping, uh, companies have been focused on substantially deleveraging their balance sheets and instituting more regularized, regularized dividend policies. Investors uh, are applauding these developments, and, and there is renewed institutional interest in the sector, both from new and old, quote unquote, investors coming back for another look. We've also seen continued and renewed interest from private equity, particularly into the gas infrastructure sector, underscoring gas's position as a transition fuel. So we've seen a series of take private transactions in the last 12 months. I can't not touch briefly on shipping's decarbonization journey, which, which remains an underlying uh, theme and, and driver for, for the industry as a whole. I believe it's well underway, uh, and increasingly we see credible plans, initiatives, and established follow-up reporting and governance structures uh, around these activities and others. Further technological development, the uniform and supportive regulatory 
environment and establishment of appropriate supply chains, among other things, are surely needed in order for the industry to meet its mandated objectives, its mandated objectives. But it is evidently, but in an evidently more nuanced world, more investors are willing to give credit to these initiatives as positively moving shipping in the direction that it needs to go. So I feel our gathering here today is uh, fortuitous, timing-wise, as the industry sails into an increasingly volatile global macroeconomic environment. Let's hear from our different panelists and see how, uh, how, they, how they look at the world and how they see things developing. Thanks again, everyone. I'm going to turn it over to Tate Sullivan, who is a managing director and senior uh, maritime research analyst, equity research analyst with Maxim, who will be moderating the drive on panel, which is our first panel. So Tate, why don't you come on up and we'll get started. Thank you. Thank you all. I'll welcome our dry bulk panelists up to the table as well. I see uh, earlier I saw Star Bulk, from Star Bulk Carriers, Carriers, President Hamish Norton, if you want to come up. Also from Genco Shipping, we have CEO John Wobensmith. And any other, and the other dry bulk will have Mr. Gary Vogel from Eagle Bulk here shortly. Understandably, with the traffic. <laughs> okay. All right. We'll we'll integrate them into the conversation. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Nicholas. Good morning. My name is Tate Sullivan, and thank you, uh, Mr. Dadic, for the comments. Uh, I am in the Maxim the Group's Equity Research Department, covering shipping companies. Thank you to our panelists. Well, thank you. And also, we have joining Safe Balkers President Dr. Lucas Martin Paris. Thank you very much. Um, and an audience for attending Capital Link's 14th Annual New York Maritime Forum. Thank you to Nicholas and his team for putting together a great lineup of panels today. And then thank you for our panelists for joining us today. Um, I introduced our executives, and we'll hear also from um, Gary from on the phone. But I point out all of the companies on our drive off panel and jumping right into comments pay dividends this year. I mean, the average dividend yield for this, the group on our panel, to, uh, panel today is 19%. And then including these dividends that massively outperform the market this year, in addition to, to just a stock return, return last year greater than 100%. Sure, well, let's get to all your comments. And do we have you over the phone? And we'll stick to alphabetical order by company name. Uh, Gary, are you on the line from Eagle Bulk? Yes, good morning, Kate. Hi, uh, hey, great to hear from you. Um, so to start with you from Eagle Bulk, um, well, can you provide your, I think out of this group on our panel today, you, you had the most recent transaction in, buy, in terms of buying the uh, 2015 built Ultramax. Can you talk about what you're seeing in the sales and purchase market? Was it a decision based on the re decline in rates, that, or in rates that we saw quarter to date? Did you have this in works for multiple months? Uh, can you talk about the recent transaction and your outlook for the S&P market, please? Absolutely, I appreciate the question. You know, we really saw this as an opportunistic um, transaction. You know, it's really a continuation. In fact, it's the 30th uh, acquisition that we've made in, in the last number of years, and, and we, it, it's considerably below the last done. So we saw it really as an opportunity. There was an illiquid window in the S&P market and, and, a, and, a, and a motivated seller because it was a, a purchase option. So. You know, it's about 15, 20% down on, on recent done transactions. And, you know, we pair that with a recent sale of a 2004 built ship uh, that we have sold called the Cardinal. We only paid $10 million more for an Ultra Max versus a, uh, a non scrubber fitted Supermax um, to go 11 years younger. So, as I said, it was really an opportunistic uh, transaction and then one that we think is, is really beneficial for Eagle and for our shareholders. Uh, thank, thank you, Gary, and I'm sure we'll hear more about fleet renewal campaigns too. And keeping the pan on going on to Genco, Mr. Mr. Wobensmith, John, you, you you highlighted in your last earnings call and presentation uh, you, your, that your net loan to ship value was about 12 percent last month. I think that's probably one of your lowest levels in your history. Can you talk about in the market going into next year? 
what would you need to see to start increasing that, or, is your, or are you still directionally going to be bringing down your leverage? Yeah, I think uh, overall directionally we're going to continue to bring it down. We have a uh, stated goal to be to net debt zero by the end of 2023, which we still think is very much obtainable. You know, going back to end of 2020, early 2021, we were uh, we were very positive that the uh, dry bulk market was turning um, and was going to move up significantly. So. We spent some time figuring out what we wanted to do on the capital allocation front, um, and we settled on two things. We, we wanted to continue fleet renewal, so we were able to do that. We bought uh, 10 ships uh, from 20, end of 2020 through to 2021 and sold some of our older vessels uh, to make our fleet more fuel efficient. Um, but then we also came up with a, uh, a dividend strategy that would involve low leverage, um, continuing to maintain high operating leverage uh, with our CAPES and our, and our Ultramax fleet, but driving down our cash flow break even into the low eight so that we could pay not only a high dividend, but also a sustainable dividend throughout any of the cycles we went back. We, we back tested all the way back to 2000 through markets, um, and we came to the conclusion that we could pay a dividend in, uh, in any type of cycle, and we think that dividends out of anything, though this may not hold true absolutely today, but you need to be a dividend payer to drive valuation. Um, and that was one of the, uh, the underlying tenets. So we think we've created the, uh, the best risk reward model um, in, in dry bulk shipping right now with that low leverage um, from, a, from a financial standpoint, but again, maintaining that high operating Thank you, John. I point out, I think you are one of the longest paying dividend payers in, in this, this current cycle as well. And mo moving to safe bulkers and then Dr. Bob Perez, your, your company announced a share repurchase plan for 5 million shares back in June, I believe, and you already repurchased, as of your last announcement, 20% of that plan in July. Can you talk about the conviction you have in this market to repurchase your plan and the importance of balanced capital allocation strategy for your company as well? Thank you. We have, uh, we have announced this uh, buyback program because uh, we believe that uh, the net asset value of, the, of our uh, fleet does not uh, reflect in the valuation of the company. Uh, we have, uh, we, we, the program is, is active uh, today and uh, uh, the reason for uh, having such a program is that uh, we managed through the, I mean, through the last quarters to have a company which is, uh, um, let's say, the way that we wanted our company to be. So we have about a leverage of about 30%. Uh, we have a strong uh, liquidity, about uh, 300 million. We have contracted revenue, uh, close to 400 million in the following years. Uh, to, we have invested uh, heavily in uh, Phase three vessels, and we have taken delivery already of, the, of this uh, first two uh, this year. These are the best vessels out there in the market. I would say, uh, I mean, they can compete uh, for uh, several, several years. Uh, we didn't wait for alternative fuels or other solutions because it will take time. Uh, but we were pragmatic. So the company has all the potential characteristics uh, of. Uh, a, in, in our fleet uh, that uh, we can support uh, a, a reasonable dividend which has a good yield about uh, more than six percent uh, but we, we we streamline our free cash flows not only to reward shareholders and you all know that uh, uh, our management has about 40 percent of the company uh, and uh, we try to continue to do so but uh, also to not to increase the leverage as we take uh, delivery of uh, the new of the new builds uh, the following uh, couple of years. Uh, I think that uh, we are very well positioned to take advantages in the low. I mean, if there is any correction in the market, and also uh, to participate uh, in the new technology era, which uh, starts from the first of January 2023. Uh, and uh, later on with uh, alternative fuel technologies that will be introduced. Thank you, Thank you very much. And I point out Safe Walkers uh, released it. one of your presentations yesterday had a great slide highlighting the different the new build rates today versus historical levels that I'm sure we'll get into that topic 
in, in a video as well. And, and, and to Starbuck and hey, hey Ms. Norton, uh, you have recently, we haven't touched on yet, the benefit of fleets with a high percentage of their vessels with scrubbers, and, and you have actually quantified that benefit okay, to the company. Right. And can you talk about, with all the volatility, we've seen oil prices, natural gas prices, where that spread stands, and, and why can you earn a tangible benefit from the scrubbers today and going forward? Yeah, I mean, basically, the, the scrubber allows us to burn a relatively inexpensive high sulfur fuel while uh, companies, ships without scrubbers have to burn relatively more expensive low sulfur fuel. And, you know, the, basically the difference between the fuel prices goes to our bottom line. Um, recently that difference has been about $280 a ton. Um, and it's held in even as oil went from $100 a barrel down to $90 a barrel. And, um, you know, I think part of the reason uh, which frankly even I wasn't very familiar with until quite recently is that, you know, the, the, that price difference reflects the expense and difficulty that refineries have in removing sulfur from their refined products. And the process they typically use is hydro desulfurization, which uses hydrogen to remove the sulfur. And some of the hydrogen is actually uh, generated in the refinery itself, but most of the hydrogen is actually generated by steam reforming of natural gas, which of course has become much more expensive recently, um, you know, due to the, uh, the issues with natural gas uh, in, in Europe. And uh, the high price of natural gas appears to be supporting the scrubber spread at, you know, pretty healthy levels. So, you know, at, at $280 a ton, uh, you know, we are earning substantially more than $200 million a year from our scrubbers. Um, and, you know, there have been, uh, there have been days when uh, our cape sizes have been, or actually the scrubbers have been earning more than the ships. Um, I, I, that is certainly something that, I mean, following the rate cycle in the dry bulk industry that I know Star Bulk, you at the Safe Bulkers, you have also disclosed how much you earn on the fuel spread that I think, I mean, I know personally I'll be paying more attention to in terms of the next year going forward. Um, Gary, swing back to you if we still have you on the line. Uh, let's look at forward a little bit and for the sector, you know, what, what do you think it will be the most important focus point for Eagle Bulk going into 2023? Will it be the regula regulations coming on board in terms of slow steaming? Will it be scrapping um, the new build rates? Uh, can, you, can you comment on your outlook for, for the next year for the industry? Will it be Russia and Ukraine? I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, uh, thanks, Tate. I mean, of course, uh, you know, geopolitical issues are, are front and center at the moment, and, and and very unpredictable. But if I if I focus on you know what, what we you know feel is our area that we can at least uh, if if not control you know you know make decisions around on, on you know proactive basis. You know we're we're constructive on the market because of the supply side. And and notwithstanding that we've had really robust rates now for really the almost almost two years. Um, you know the order book remains and it's extremely low at just around 7%. So, you know, we're constructive on the market overall. I think the other thing worth mentioning is, you know, it's really been led by the minor bulks in the mid-size segment. I mean, we have an exclusive focus on supermax and ultramax vessels. And, you know, while there's a lot of, you know, talk about the weakness in the market, particularly led by the Capes, you know, the mid-size segment has averaged $25,000 a year to date. And today, our Baltic Supermax index is just under 18,000. And, and we also have over 90% of our fleet fitted with scrubbers, so we're enjoying you know, significant benefits from the fuel spreads that Hamish was speaking about. You know, so as we look forward, it, it's really about you know, our, our focus on the midsize going into next year. I mean, mid, minor bulks led demand last year. Um, they're leading demand this year, and we expect that that will continue next year. So it's about our active management approach using you know, chartering in ships to supplement our own fleet of, of 53 ships, you know, using derivatives to hedge market risk and, and, re and really executing. And notwithstanding you know, short-term you know, volatility, and particularly on you know, you know, less growth this year you know, than, than what was expected previously, we think the supply side 
is really the main driver of why we're so constructive on the market in the medium and long term. Thank you. Growth to you, John. What are you highlighting uh, what you're focused on going into 2023 and also introduced into the discussion as well the IMO GHG ratings where ships will receive a rating between A to E, you highlighted in your pres one of your presentations, leading to some potential scrapping. But can you highlight anything that you'd echo from Gary or, or your own comments going into 23? Yeah, so we, um, we've actually spent uh, most of uh, this year so far getting our fleet um, ready for, for next year. And even though there isn't a, uh, you know, a hard start uh, on January 1st, like maybe we've had with other regulations, it's measured throughout 2023, we dry docked um, the majority of our Cape size fleet, um, quite, a, quite a bit of our, of our Ultramax fleet as well. And we spent about $20 million this year on upgrading that fleet uh, to get ready for for next year on the uh, on the IMO 2023 front, and and the nice thing about spending you know 20 million dollars sounds like sounds like a lot for a fleet of 44 ships, but the the actual payback on that investment, and we do look at it as a, as an investment because you are saving in uh, in, in fuel and and upgrading your fleet, um, so you have a payback period of about a year, a year and a half. Um, basis today's fuel prices. Um, so it's, it's great to um, get your fleet ready for regulations, but you know, most importantly, lead on the GHG front, um, but also have a return on your investment. So that's, that's what we've set ourselves up for for next year. I, I you know, agree with Gary, we're, we're constructive on the market. Um, obviously, we see the same situation on the, uh, on the supply side. I do I do feel that the Cape size sector, um, of which we have 17 of our, of our 44 ships, um, will start to come back. I do think you'll have more of a natural spread as you get into next year, meaning Capes um, at a higher level than, uh, than the mid sized sector. And, and what I'm basing that on is, is China coming back um, on the steel front. And China has taken a real beating um, from real estate, COVID lockdowns, um, and I am, uh, I'm fairly positive that that is going to uh, correct itself going into next year. I think we've already seen um, at least some green shoots on that front with steel production moving up to uh, utilization of about 88% from a low in July of 75. Um, and there seems to be a lot of stimulus and infrastructure uh, spending that uh, is now in the pipeline. So I'm, I'm fairly optimistic on the larger ships as we get into next year. Again, the supply situation, you, you just can't, uh, you can't ignore that. It's, um, it's the best we've seen in, uh, in a very long time. And it continues. Um, to order a ship today, you're talking about 2025 now for, uh, for delivery. So, um, we, you know, again, we, we think we have, a, we have a good few years at least here. Thank you, thank you. And Dr. Graham Barton Paris. Uh, transitioning to, to, from John's comments about the supply dynamic, you, you are taking delivery of new build ships this year. Can you talk about your conviction to order those ships and offsetting those the entry of those new ships in the market? Will there be scrapping this year? Um, yes, I, I, I don't uh, believe that the scrapping will take place this year, but uh, there are, uh, uh, I mean, despite all the efforts that we all do uh, in uh, updating uh, the fleet, uh, uh, the, the important thing that we need to note is that by May 2024, uh, the environmental performance of the vessels uh, of 2023 uh, will be assessed and about 15% of the fleet will be uh, rated as E. And E means uh, that uh, uh, you need to uh, submit immediately a plan for upgrades, not for D category, but for C. And, the, and there will be also 20% of the fleet will be a, a D. And, and this will take place, and the, the submission of such plan should be within uh, uh, three, uh, three years. If, if you are consecutively three years in D category, you need to submit submit uh, such a plan. So what I want to say is that one way or the other, uh, E and D vessels will be uh, 
candidates for scrapping after 2024. So if, you, if a company has a, is able to do upgrades like ours, uh, this will uh, and avoids uh, such uh, uh, classifications, I mean in E and category, that, that would be very, very beneficial uh, for, uh, for our trade, but uh, there will be so many vessels in these categories. Uh, ours, our, we have selected to compete uh, not only on the basis of upgrades, but also on uh, on investing uh, in uh, hard assets, 11 uh, new builds, uh, very close to 30 million uh, Panamax, post Panamax, which also we, we know that vessels uh, right now uh, cost about uh, 40, uh, 40 million or so. Uh, there might be some corrections in the future if the market stays there. So I think that uh, uh, one fourth of, the, of our fleet in the coming two years will be phase three and will be the best. So I think that uh, we, keep, we maintain some ships in the spot market. We also have discovered benefit in uh, heavy consuming ships, so the company itself will be able to, uh, to perform well the following years. Now, in terms of the pragmatic uh, situation out there, we have uh, the tension, we have wars, uh, we have to uh, understand that the situation is not as usual. Uh, the, the, I believe that charter rates uh, rely on the performance of uh, uh, and the decision of China, because uh, uh, Chinese need to secure all two problems. The one is the COVID problem and the restrictions, and the second problem that they need to resolve is the housing sector. If these uh, problems are resolved, uh, then the Chinese economy will uh, grow up faster and uh, the trade will be facilitated. Thank you very, very much. And on the regulatory front as well, I believe the EU will have some potential taxes going into 24 based on the amount of emitted generated CO2 from the ships as well, potentially. But Hamish, for your, your large fleet, and we touched on the benefit of the scrubbers going into next year, uh, what is a strategic focus for you next year? Do you think we'll have more repercussions from the Russia-Ukraine war for dry bulk as, as other sectors have benefited from that situation? Or would you like to touch on another outlook point going into next year? Well, you know, look, the, the, uh, the Ukraine war is, uh, is obviously a, a terrible thing. It, it has had a remarkably sort of small impact on the dry bulk market so far. Um, you know, it's had, it's had a, a caused a reduction in grain shipments, although uh, the grain shipments from other places are traveling further distances than they normally would because everybody's basically panicking to try to get grain from, from anywhere. I, mean, I, I heard even that uh, China had imported a, a shipload of wheat uh, designed for making fine croissant in order to feed to pigs because their pigs needed some grain. They had to get it from somewhere. Um, so, uh, but, but you know, the war has also uh, caused far more ton miles of coal to be shipped uh, than, than otherwise would be the case. And, and we even took a cape size full of coal from Australia to Rotterdam, which I think is the first time, I think it's safe to say, we've ever done that. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, so th that's, that's important. But, you know, I think, I, I think the thing that is very important to keep in mind in, in the even longer term is, is decarbonization. As, as um, uh, John and, and, and Lucas were, were talking about, uh, you know, as long as we have a push for decarbonization in the shipping industry, we're going to have a very good business. Uh, because um, the fleet has to be turned over. We have to basically have a fleet with much reduced or even zero carbon. And uh, the only way that comes about is if there are profits to fund that fleet. And where do the profits come from? They basically come from having 10% of the fleet regulated out of existence every now and then. And, um, you know, we are lucky in that we don't have that first 10% or even the second 10% that's going to get regulated out of existence. And I don't think my colleagues are in control of such ships either. Um, and, uh, you know, if you're not 
part of the group who's having their fleet regulated out of existence, you're going to start making a lot of money, um, which, which has to happen in order to justify financing of what will inevitably be the, the very expensive new buildings that will be the, the very low carbon or zero carbon ships of the future. Thank you, and I think your comments support the multi-year outlook for the sector going into, you mentioned earlier, John, new builds, not slots not available until 2025. And also, John, you mentioned some green shoots in China. It seems like the whole market has had some negative news from the China front recently. Gary, Gary can you talk about, have you also seen any green shoots in terms of the rate outlook as well? And uh, do you think, when and separately introducing another topic to the panel, when, when should we start as investors and analysts anticipating more orders for new ships going out beyond 25? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, first, first of all, I, I just want to circle back on, on, on the, the new building front. And I mean, it is, you know, 2025 is a long time to wait for a ship. But I think there's two other aspects why I think we're going to continue to see muted, muted order. And, I mean, uh, a number of reasons. But I think two of the big ones here are, first of all, secondhand assets are just simply, you know, more, uh, more interesting, or, or I'll just let's say plain, I think, are just a better investment in terms of a return standpoint. I mean, case in point, the ship we just acquired on, on an age-adjusted basis, aside from the fact that you're, you're buying that ship today and you're able to generate significant revenues from both the forward rate environment, which by the way, we think is back, overly backward dated and, and too low, but even on the current forward curve and based on fuel spreads, you'll generate significant you know, capital over the next two and a half years instead of waiting for that new ship. You know, to the tune, we think the, the, the parity is about $5 million on that acquisition, you know, as compared with ordering a new building today. And the other thing which speaks to decarbonization, and Hamish touched upon it, is, you know, a ship order today that delivers in 2025, you know, that ship effectively in its economic life is going to sail all the way up to 2050. And to have that tail risk of, of a ship that's only going to be 20, you know, 10 years old in 2035, you know, we, we think it's unquantifiable, but we think it's quite significant, which is why we continue to focus on, on, the, on ships in, you know, kind of 2015, 16, 17. So, you know, for those reasons, I think, you know, we can be optimistic that, you know, ordering will, will remain muted. You know, in, in terms of, you know, rate developments going forward, I've been doing this for 34 years, you know, dry bulk, and, you know, I think it's just too difficult to, you know, say, well, oh, here's where here's where the upturn, you know, the, the quarter it comes, or or even the month it comes from, and what the catalyst is. I think, you know, what we do is, you know, although we have people on our trading desk who do that every day on on a you know, spot basis, you know, I think it's helpful to pull back and, and again look at the supply side um, versus versus demand. And while demand is very very weak right now, and, and being supported by Ten Mile, it's the supply side that that, that again you know, is really positive. And that supply side, of course, hasn't been supported, you know, by scrapping. And, and you know, while an order, a new ship is, is effectively going to be around for 20, 25, or even, even, you know, 27 years, you know, scrapping can be deferred. And, and, and but, you know, old ships are <coughs> 15 years, you know, they need to dry dock, you know, every two and a half years, you know, which, which means that basically 40% of ships over 15 years old need to dry dock every year. And that's a pretty significant, um, you know, hurdle in which you have to decide: Are you willing to invest in that ship, continue to invest in that ship, or, or, or scrap it and have a positive cash flow event? So it's for those reasons that we're constructing. Although you know, I can't sit here and tell you, you know, what what uh, what month. You know, I think that 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 catalyst will really, you know, take take hold. Great, thank you, Gary. And I mean, it's a positive supply side dynamic for for many years. This is supporting of the rates, and then. I would like to touch a little bit on the demand side. I also want to make sure all of you have time to deliver any closing statements or circle back to any topics that maybe we didn't give enough, I didn't give enough to attention to. But, but John, can you talk on the demand side a little bit to your earlier question about China green shoots and how the importance of China demand for the, for the dry bulk sector and how quickly can it come back or, or will it take longer than we think? Well, or is there a chance I mean, there? For, first of all, it's, in, it's incredibly important. Um, you know, there is uh, the dry bulk trade 
Over the last uh, 20 years, it's probably shifted from maybe 10 to 15 percent reliant on China, up to 35 to 40 percent um, of the dry bulk trade, and you're talking about a correlation, I think, of around 70 percent of Chinese GDP with um, with the BDI. Um, whereas you look at the U.S., it's close to zero, and Europe is around 35 percent. So it is the key driver to the dry bulk shipping industry, whether you love it or hate it, it it's, it's here to stay. Um, you know, the green shoots that I've been talking about, again, I, it, it's coming out of COVID lockdowns. As I said before, they have really um, put a damper on the, on the Chinese economy. Um, I think it's very clear that reaching a five or five and a half percent GDP growth this year is not going to happen. Um, and we have seen it directly in much lower iron ore imports, um, the steel production, which, which drives that. Um, even grain shipments up until recently um, have, been, uh, have been lackluster, though. We are expecting a very firm U.S. golf season, and uh, ch the Chinese seem to be buying grains um, in large amounts once again. So, you know, again, I, we've all sort of talked about it, but I'm gonna continue to go back to supply side, supply side, supply side, even though it's demand. It, it, it just allows um, these hiccups that, that tend to, that happen every once in a while, what I'll call them demand shocks, um, which we have seen from time to time, but they tend to be very short-lived, and because of that, that nice runway on the, on the lack of supply, which tends to upend markets for long periods of time, this really is a demand issue right now. And if you go back and you look, you had the financial crisis in 08, look how quickly we snapped back from that, from that demand shock. You had the Brazilian dam disaster in the first quarter of 19, we snapped back from that. And then we had COVID, of course, and we came back from that in a very quick fashion. And, and I, I don't see this demand shock being any different um, in that the, uh, the Chinese government is uh, not only being proactive, but they're incentivized to, uh, to get their economy moving again. So again, you know, supply and demand look pretty good for uh, for the next few years. And, and where we started uh, today, most of the drywall companies operate with lower leverage than those previous, but then before those previous instances on the demand front. Um, Lucas, uh, with the time we have left, uh, would you like to certainly talk about anything that we didn't touch on in terms of with safe bulkers? Yes, I, uh, I just want to add uh, some gear. Of course, China. Clearly, is uh, most important, but also we have seen changes in trade because also Europe right now is playing an important role because uh, we, uh, Europe needs to import uh, coal, uh, Russian coal that does not import anymore. Uh, so, so, although there is some, let's say, difficulties with China, and we hope that this will be resolved. We have also Europe from the other side, we have longer distances, we have also India that can uh, play a role. I mean, for us, uh, transition is very important. Uh, if I make a closing statement to save buckets, transition is very important that towards uh, this uh, a new era that, that we are going. And uh, I think uh, a, a part of the upgrades, you need to do hard investments uh, in order to improve uh, uh, the fleet efficiency because uh, we all know that uh, a part of the IMO regulations, a part of the EU, Trading scheme uh, which, uh, which is uh, in place from 1st of January, as we referred. Uh, we have also in, in, in states also new regulations are passed uh, from uh, vessels which will be active in the following years. Uh, and probably in China, so uh, there will be substantial restrictions in a couple of years for all vessels which don't comply with, uh, with, the, with the climate uh, uh, initiatives. Uh, and I think the safe package is there to play a major role in. Uh, even of that, if you will, at a certain point of time when they start uh, being produced. Hamish, also with us closing comment, but I'd love to, if you can, if we're willing to integrate some some comments on the um, deal activity with all the environmental regulations in the next couple of years, and and also whatever you'd like to highlight as a close. Yeah, sure. 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 I, look, I I, I think um, you know to echo some comments I've heard. We're not going to order any ships until and unless we know what to order. You know, we don't want a stranded asset. If we order a ship today, we're pretty sure it's not the ship we're going to want in 2030. 
and so we're, we're not ordering ships today. Uh, it also, as, as, as Gary said, doesn't make financial sense to order ships today. Um, we, uh, we have, however, succeeded in just about doubling the size of our fleet through uh, sort of eight small M&A transactions in the last th three years and a bit. Uh, where we were able to issue our share, you know, at or above NAV um, to, to uh, acquire vessels, um, uh, you know, even when our share was trading uh, somewhat, somewhat below NAV. Um, but, you know, uh, I would hope to be able to continue to do those deals. I think that those may be actually easier to do in a bad market than a, than a good market. Um, but, um, you know, for the, for the, basically, our strategy is to defend our dividend. We have a dividend policy that basically you know, pays out the cash above a certain threshold. And uh, we do not intend to use that cash to, uh, you know, order ships or buy ships. We intend to continue using that cash to pay a dividend, and we would renew our fleet, you know, if, as, and when we can use our equity as currency in a way that's good for the shareholders, um, where you know we can we can feel good about that capital investment and and uh, make a profit for all concerned. Great. Uh, well, thank you for all the panelists. I mean, we heard thematically the supply side, and it, it's great following up Nicholas, your conference that you hosted back in Posidonia in June to hear the comments going into the next year, and I mean, overwhelmingly positive on the supply side, some uncertainties on the demand side, and look forward to seeing how the sector navigates going into the next year as well, too, so, and, and with operating with lower leverage, and again, dividend yields of well over 15%. Uh, thank you all to the panelists today. I think uh, coming up next, we have the next panel is starting at 9, will be starting shortly with Global Commerce, and thank you Gary on the line as well. Global Commerce and Global Supply Chain Challenges, and the moderator will be Mr. John Bradley from Better Price. Thank you, thank you very much.